And you look at people who leave the sector for periods of time and then you wait to see where they turn back up and you'll see that I'm true. I, I tell the truth on that one, that it is like the mafia. You, you just, you can't leave. It wants you to come back in when you've got that passion. And that's when I ended up looking for a job back in the industry because I thought this is this is where I want to be. This is the passion that I have. It's for it's for international education and education more broadly. G'day and welcome to Global Horizons. I'm your host, Rob Malicki, coming today from Garrigal Land in Sydney. I'm super pleased to be on the podcast today with an old friend. I'm really privileged to call this guest an old friend. It's Tracy Harris, very well known in the industry. Thanks for joining me on Global Horizons, Tracy. Thanks, Rob. It's great to be here. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on this land I'm joining you. And and maybe a little bit less on the old and, and let's say long-standing friendship. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting that age, are we? <laughs> I love it. And today's story starts on a very different piece of land. And you're in your 20s, you're in a taxi in Jakarta. And if I can paint the picture for listeners, you're going a little bit, the taxi driver's driving a little bit too fast, the taxi's moving around, bumping around, the traffic's crazy like it always is in Jakarta. And you're sitting in the back seat and you're wondering what the hell you've done. Do you want to tell us the story? Yeah. So for, to give a little bit of backstory, I grew up in Canberra, born and bred, went to university in Canberra and Canberra at the time had a population of about 300,000 and I joined the University of Canberra doing student recruitment. My very first overseas holiday of my adult life was to Jakarta, a uh, population I think at the time of about 16 million. So as you said, the traffic was crazy. There was lots of people around, more people than I've ever seen in my entire life. But what made it crazier and, and uh, you know frightening in the end was that I'd been told I needed to tell the taxi driver to put the meter on, but nobody had told me that I had to get into a blue taxi. Don't get into the yellow taxis, but I'd got into a yellow taxi not knowing this. So when I said to the taxi driver, you have to put the meter on, he didn't like that at all. And so he made the taxi ride very crazy, unpleasant. He put his seat right back. He was leaning back while he was driving, driving erratically. And then we got to a point where he just stopped and said, this is as far as I can go. And I paid him and I got out and I had no idea where I was. I didn't know the address for where I was going. It was the first time I'd been there. As it turned out, he dropped me about 150, 200 metres from where I needed to go. But when I got out of the taxi and realised that I didn't know where I was, and, and we're talking day pre-Google me, Google Maps and mobile phones and everything, I was thinking, what have I done? I am clearly in the wrong industry. I was thinking... I'm a you know worldly woman. I've I've got a, a a university degree. I can handle Jakarta. And I, at that time, I was thinking, oh boy, I have made the biggest career mistake of my life. That feels so bad, doesn't it? That moment where suddenly you're standing on a street corner and you're looking at the traffic going by, no idea where you are, and just this sinking feeling that everything is wrong. That's right. And it's funny, isn't it, when you think about the travel that I've done over the years, because I've, I've had a fantastic career and had opportunities to go to lots of different places. And there have been times where I've been in that situation where I've just been frightened and thinking, what, why am I here? What am I doing? But then something else will happen and, and there'll be a wonderful experience out of it. But I was just thinking of, of a not so great experience about how things can really hit you. I remember being in Hong Kong and having had my suitcase dropped, clearly dropped by the baggage handlers so that when I got to the hotel room, I couldn't unlock it. And I remember being in my hotel room in Hong Kong, bawling my eyes out because I couldn't unlock my suitcase. Because when you're traveling and you're on your own, there's a sense of vulnerability and a sense of aloneness. And you think that the whole, I don't know, the whole world is out to get you or something. But actually, in reality, just the suitcase lock was broken. I went out and bought another lock the next day. But at the time, I, I was bawling my eyes out over the, the broken lock of the suitcase. It is that thing, isn't it? It's like I, I find when I travel somewhere new, I'm always anxious until I, I get to my accommodation for the first time. It's like once you've got that little bubble of security around you, then it's kind of like, okay, I've, I've got my little home base. I can, I can start to you know branch out from here little step by little step. And maybe that's what 
makes that Jakarta experience, yeah, one of your first experiences so confronting. It's like you're just in the deep end. There's no bubble of security at all. It's just literally you've just been thrown in and good luck. And I remember getting to that hotel. So again, first time in Jakarta. And there was a woman, I I think from the University of Wollongong, maybe at the time, certainly a couple of decades older than me, in front of me checking in. And I remember her saying to the hotel, I need to be on a high floor. Tick. Uh, It has to be away from the lift. Tick. It's got to be a non-smoking room. I don't want single beds. It's got to be a queen size or a king size bed. And so she listed these things. And I, again, you know, this young woman in my 20s was thinking, she's a bit precious, isn't she? It didn't take long (laughs) for me to be that person to realize that actually that little haven, as you said, when you turn up to somewhere and you're in a foreign land, that room is your haven. It's your sanctuary. And I've stayed in rooms that have smelled like cigarette smoke, that have been next to the lift that sounds like a rocket ship going up and down all night. Because people think we're very, I used to cop a lot of slack from friends of mine about all this overseas travel, that it seems so glamorous. And actually, when you're schlepping a 12 kilo, uh, they called them the bazooka back then, the display for the university that you're you schlepping 12 kilos of that around, standing on chairs in your T-shirt, putting it up, working all weekend, travelling economy class. It There were some fantastic experiences, but it, it, there was no glamour in it at all. I, I've got to tell you a story. I, I want to come back to the, the, the kind of sliding door moments of, you know, where literally you could have, you know, that, that's the kind of experience that is traumatising enough that people never go back. So I'm really come, keen to come back and explore why you're still here. Uh, but but a little a little story that, that I don't think I've ever told you before, but back when I think I first met you, you would have been working for Department of Education, so That's Federal right. Department of Education at the time. Yeah. And I, I think we must have been on a panel together somewhere. It was like an early morning panel at a conference. And and, and we'd caught up in the morning and maybe we were having a coffee and we we're on our way to the conference and you'd, you'd float in the night before. And I remember you saying to me, I always try to get in the night before so I'm fresh so that I can really, you know, do my best and deliver my best w- when I'm here. And at the time, I'd only just started my own business. You know, I was maybe like six months into my own business. So I'd been on the 6 a.m. flight down to, I think it was Melbourne at the time. So I was on the 6 a.m. flight and I was thinking, oh, I'm never going to do that. Like, I'll, yeah. I'll always, I'll just save the money. Like, I, I don't want to, you know, within within 12 months, like I'm I'm flying in the night before. So. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, and again, people think you're very precious. and But it's those small comforts when you're traveling for work that are really important. You know, I've stayed in hotels where I've had to push the tall boy up against the door because I really didn't feel that safe in it. You need to really feel safe in that environment when you're travelling for work and you're on your own. Where was that? It, that was in Malaysia. In It was either in Ipo. Yeah, it would have been in Ipo. Wow. It was not a great hotel and I remember being on an IDP event and I was not the only, and it's, you know, especially this industry attracts a lot of women and so there was a lot of single women travelling on our own and at breakfast the next day we were all sharing that, yep, I'd push, somebody pushed the chair or the tall boy or whatever it was up against the, the door because it just didn't feel that safe. The lock didn't seem that good on it. Yeah, that's that's not glamorous, is it? Not at all. Not no. glamorous. Let's go back to sort of Jakarta, standing on that street corner. I mean, obviously you recovered from that, that initial shock and, and stayed in the industry, but have there been other times where you've been confronted enough that you'd, you'd think that, you know, maybe maybe a door was sliding and you might have headed out into another industry? I think, so there's two that I can think of and one at the very, very beginning of my career and, and maybe one towards where I am now. The one at the very beginning, I was, so to, how I got into the industry, how did I get into the international education? I was a, a uni student. I was at the University of Canberra and I was studying arts communication and I got a part-time job at the English Centre there running independent learning centre for English language students. Back then, we're talking the late 80s, early 90s, so mostly Vietnamese scholarship students, so they would have been under AusAid scholarship awards. And I loved it. I loved talking to the students. Uh, they, I, This independent learning centre I ran for about an hour and a half every day, and the students would come in and do self-study, and they would talk to me because I, especially being a comms student, as most people will know, I'm also an extrovert, so I'm happy to talk to anybody about anything. So I would talk to them, and I 
was finding it to be a really terrific experience. And at the end of my study, I thought, I'm going to stay on university and I'm going to do six months and learn Japanese and I'm going to go over to Japan and learn and teach English because this being part of the English language sector is something that I'm, I'm really interested in. But then I met a boy and decided that actually going to Japan was not going to be in my immediate future because it wouldn't be the same without him. And we recently celebrated our 29th wedding anniversary. So it was a good decision. <laughs> Very good decision. So I decided not to go to Japan and, and not to teach English. And I have thought if I didn't, I, I, don't, I don't regret that decision in any way, shape or form because we've had a fantastic life together. I have thought though, is that would be a sliding doors moment of what if I had gone to Japan and mm. what if I taught English? Would I have stayed in the English language environment or would I have worked it ended up working in recruitment anyway because I've got a marketing comms background and so by staying in Australia I then a job when uni so I was still studying Japanese I thought well there's no point me continue studying Japanese and a job came up at an organization called the Canberra Council for International Students at the CCIS it doesn't sadly it doesn't exist anymore it was an organization there was one in most capital cities in Australia and I think CISWA is the closest one that still exists in Western Australia funded by back then funded by AusAid and also had some funding by the universities and we ran a social events for the members of the CCIS and it was international and domestic students and I was the only employee so it was a it was a voluntary organization I was the administrative officer and we ran an international night we took students down to the snow and we went to the beach because you know, being in Canberra you've got that opportunity and I just loved it I that was so I I'd gone from the English language center where I loved being around the students and then being with the CCIS and again being around the students. And to me, that's been the story. And if you see what I've done since then or, or read what I've written, I really always keep coming back to the students because they're the thing that's kept me in the sector for so long. They were sliding doors at the very early stages of my career where I could have gone and done marketing communication for, I don't know, a, you know, a different kind of company. I want to come back to the sliding doors, but I'd, I'd love to take that little side door to, to Japan, where, like knowing yourself now, where do you think you would have ended up if you had gone to Japan? I think I would have stayed in education of some description. Whether I would have been a teacher, a long term teacher, maybe, but I found, you know, I've been now in international education and education more broadly for over 30 years. And my most recent sliding door, if I can, you know, jump forward twenty five, almost thirty years uh, later. It, during COVID, you, you, I was one of the people that was unfortunately impacted, and I was working for RMIT at the time, and my job was made redundant along with some of my team and six hundred others at RMIT and lots of others are, around Australia. And while I was thinking about, well, what what do I want to do next? And you know, the sector we didn't know where the sector was going to go. I ended up getting a job with Fire Rescue Victoria, working with them in their secretariat governance area because that's a, having been in the public sector, that's a, another area that I have some expertise in. And you know, emergency services, what a worthwhile industry to be a part of. They're doing fantastic work, doing also prevention as well as saving lives. And it didn't take me long to realise that actually this was not where I wanted to be. The, this was not my passion. International education was my passion. And something I've said to people who know me will have heard me tell, tell this story before, but the things I've said about, thing I've said about the international education industry is that it's like the mafia. You try to leave and it sucks you back in. And you look at people who leave the sector for periods of time and then you wait to see where they turn back up and you'll see that I'm true. I, I tell the truth on that one, that it is like the mafia. You, you just, you can't leave. It wants you to come back in when you've got that passion. And that's when I ended up looking for a job back in the industry because I thought this is this is where I want to be. This is the passion that I have. It's for it's for international education and education more broadly. I just had this visual as you were saying, it's like the mafia. I was thinking of like a black hole and this planet, you know, out in outer space trying to escape. I'm trying to escape the velocity. <laughs> Let me go. 
It's not possible. Not possible. <laughs> I'm sure you can think of at least half a dozen people just off the top oh. of your head. But and, and, and me, I mean, and you and all of this. It's has, so true. Exactly. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful. So now you have had a, a fascinating career and you've worked across so many different areas and types of organizations. When when I met you, you were working for government, Department of Ed, onto Austrade, and then into the unis. You've worked for the, the colleges as well, working for yourself at, at, at the moment. So what I'm fascinated about is this difference in working styles, the ways that we have to work between working inside government and working for other sorts of organisations, whether it's a uni, a college, or what, what have you. So, what does somebody who's working inside government need to know about, you know, the way things operate inside those institutions, and and vice versa? So, I think that if I look at when I was in government, I remember, and I'd been working for the University of Canberra so before I moved into the Department of Education, working for Australian Education International. I remember having a conversation with somebody and them and them saying to me, oh, well, we'll get the universities to do that. And me saying, why would you think the universities would want to do that? So I do think that there is sometimes a disconnect between the public sector who are operating in, in a policy environment where the key stakeholder is the minister. I think I, I'm flip-flopping, but what do people outside of government need to understand is that the key stakeholder is not the public. The key stakeholder is your minister. That's the thing that you are mo fo most focused on with everything that you do. So that is something that I think that people outside need to understand. It's, it's not the public. That's a really interesting reflection. I, I guess it took me a long time to realise something along those lines too, because having spent time around Department of Ed and DFAT with the new Colombo plan, I came to suddenly see that you know if somebody writes a letter to a minister, that letter can then get, get circulated down through an organisation requiring a response from all sorts of different people and can actually suck up just a disproportionate amount of time. And, and, and that's just the system, right? Like the minister is accountable to the public, so they have to respond and therefore they pass it through to the department to, to service. But the workload involved in that can be just astronomical. So let me tell you about what happens if you write to the Prime Minister. Say you're going to write to the Prime Minister about an education issue. It will end up in Prime Minister and Cabinet. So it might go to the PM's office and then it will end up in Prime Minister and Cabinet. It goes from their parliamentary area to an area that is relevant to the topic and maybe down from what is a very senior person, maybe two levels down. That person then writes a response to the recipient. That then has to go through three or four people before it goes to the recipient or the person in Prime Minister and Cabinet might decide, actually, it's the the other agency, the, the uh, responsible agency that needs to answer that. Mm. So then they will then send it three layers back up, back over to that central agency, the responsible agency, that then goes back down to, you know, somebody at a very junior level who writes the response. It goes back up through several layers back over to the PM's office and finally out. That one letter of one page could be handled by 10 people yeah, in the public service. Right. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary. We're lucky to have a democracy that works like that. I was shocked actually when I when I discovered just how much time goes into that. So I think that, that it really answering your question, if I can answer it a bit more succinctly, is that they both need a greater appreciation of each other and what actually goes on within the machinery of both of them. I do think that the higher education sector could learn a lot from government and the way that it operates in terms of efficiency. I, I know that that sounds like an oxymoron, government and efficiency. But actually, when I found by going back into, you know, having been in a university and then going back into a university after I, I left government, there is a lot of the governance procedures that happen in government because you're so focused on it being taxpayer money so you get you get that drummed in your mind that you are spending if you're doing programs you're, you're spending taxpayer money so the governance that you have to take when you're looking at that it, it really I think that universities could learn a lot more there's a lot of there's a lot of waste in both organization in both types of organizations but there is an awful lot of waste that happens in higher education that I think that they could learn from the, what happens in government the thing that's always that always I always marveled at when I was interacting with with government departments was the way that policy is so carefully developed I mean it's debated out it's written up it's documented and then when when you get down to operating 
against that policy, there's a lot of cross-checking that happens, you know, people looking back at those policies and making sure things are aligning and things like that. Whereas, I mean, I find in universities, maybe things just kind of happen a little bit with less structure sometimes. And maybe that's where things things start to fall apart. I think you're right. And I think also you can see it in government when they when it's the haste of policy making, that when things go wrong is usually when policy is made on the run. There isn't the opportunity to take the time to think about what's the implication of the policy and when it's implemented, what the outcome of it's going to be. And and I you know, during the Kevin Rudd era, Rudd Gillard Rudd time, the you could really see why some of the disasters happened in policy making that happened because the pressure was on the go- from the government into the public service to just get stuff done and you didn't have that time to really do the proper checks and balances and you do due diligence that you really needed to do and then that's when disasters happen let's take a step back up to where we were before we took that little side door out to Japan yeah. and then let us down a hole. We're talking about sliding doors. So you said you're, you, you're at another sliding door kind of moment. So after I was, I was telling the story that after I was made redundant from RMIT, I went and worked for FRV for a little while. And then a role as the general manager and dean of Swinburne College. It's a pathway college, a joint venture between Swinburne University and UP Education. That role came up and I was successful in getting it. And probably about a year and a half into it, I started to think, I'm not sure this job is for me. I'm not sure that this is what I want to be doing. A joint venture is is tough, but by its nature, working for a private company that that has its own draw and I was I felt like I was fighting fire if we go to go using my fire analogy I was fighting fires or battles all the time and I got to the point where I thought at the age that I'm at this is there's a sliding doors moment here I could keep doing what I'm doing and I still had time left on my contract. And there were some fantastic parts about what the job was. You know, seeing students actually be successful and go on to the university and then succeed at the university. Some of the teaching staff we had were terrific. I loved my leadership team. So I could have stayed. It's also, you know, I'm a woman in my 50s. And it's not something that you don't think about when you decide to leave a job, to go out into an uncertain environment that, what will I do if I take some time off? Will, will I get another job again? You, you do worry about it. it it's something that, that's crossed my mind. But ultimately, after talking to my husband and deciding that this really wasn't what I wanted to do, I decided to quit without another job to go to. Now, I've never done that in my entire life. But after 30 years, I thought, well, actually, I, I want a break. I, I need to do something different, shake things up, and let's take a break from the work from the full-time workforce. So that's when I set up my company so that I could do some work on the side. So I I set up Tracy Harris Solutions because I, if you ask my staff throughout my career, what do I focus on? I'm I'm outcomes focused. I like solutions. I'm a very positive person and, and so I'm solutions focused. So Tracy Harris Solutions. But really that was set up so that I could do a little bit of work with clients that need my help, but don't need me full time, just need me to come in, do do a piece of work, leave or work just a few hours a week for a period of time. Then they're not looking for me to do big major projects because I then decided that I wanted to do some study. That, that was well, actually, if I can reverse and say, actually what I decided I wanted to do was take a year out of the full-time work. And how could I anchor myself this year and not feel like I was just taking a middle-aged gap year and, you know, I don't know, going to the movies every day or having coffee with people every day. And so I decided that I would do some study and what did I want to do? And having been in the in Swinburne College and working within an environment that had a vocational provider, it's dual sector, I decided to do the Certificate for Training and Assessment. And so I'm currently studying that. Now, does that mean I want to then go and be a vet teacher? Not necessarily, but maybe. I've, I've tossed up the idea of maybe doing a bit of casual teaching. I have decided that I don't think I want to work full time again. I like the lifestyle that I have. I like 
helping individual clients. I, I'm sure that we'll come to, I'm working with Dirk Mulder on the Koala News. So I'm a, a contributor to the Koala News. And if I'm going to do a plug, if you're not already subscribed, make sure you go and subscribe to the Koala News. Uh, Dirk, Koala News. Planet. So I write for the Koala News, which I really enjoy doing as well. And I'm doing some study. And so I'm not sure what the next step looks like, but I don't think it looks like me working in another really big job running an organisation with 100 staff again. I I might back up a little to ask my first question. That moment when you decided, I'm going to quit, do you remember what it felt like? Honestly, it was a relief. So there was, it's, it's, there's mixed emotions. There's some fear for sure that, that you, because that fear of I'm only in my early fifties, I can't afford to just quit my job and be out of work forever. I, I, you know, I do need to work. So there's some fear, but there was also a sense of relief that I really wasn't, you know, when you, anybody who's done some psychology, there's this thing called cognitive dissonance. When you've got your values and what you're doing every day is fighting against the values that you have, you live with this distress of I, th this is not this is not me. This is not what I want to be doing. And so, actually, making that decision was a huge sense of relief. What advice would you have for somebody that might be struggling with that decision? Because I think lots of us do do every day, right? Find your exit strategy. That's honestly my advice. Actually, there's two steps to the advice. The first is. Can you live with what's going on? Is there something you can change? Is there, you can't change the leadership. You can't change how things are operating other than within your circle of control. So is there something in your circle of control that you can change that will make you think that this is going to be a better place for me to be? And if you decide that that is not the case, that there is nothing that you can do is going to change the way you feel about the position that you find yourself in, then the next thing you've got to do is find your exit strategy. Now, not everybody is in a position like I am in being able to just say, well, I'm just going to quit. And, and I've been in jobs before where I have thought, yeah, it's time for me to move on. I, I need to go and do something else. And then I've just started looking for other jobs. And that's where you start to network and you know start to apply, talk to people and, and get yourself another job. Staying though and fighting the fight and fight, you know, beating your head against a brick wall, it, it doesn't change anything. It, you know, all it does is disrupt you and your life. You need to find your exit strategy. One of the things that I like to say when I talk to people about, and people say, oh, you run your own business, you know, is that you have, you have ultimate control over what you're going to do, but you also have ultimate responsibility. I mean, nobody's, nobody's going to pay that paycheck if, if no work's coming in. So, Yes, I can have a, a a nap at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, but chances are I could also be on the laptop at 11 p.m. tidying up something that I really need to get done. So ultimate control and responsibility. But how does it feel for you, like since you've stepped out of the full time into this? So I was only talking to my husband about this at the weekend. I'm so busy. <laughs> <laughs> so that nap, that nap, you know, the nap of at two o'clock in the afternoon. I think that so it's funny, isn't it? Because I think that that's what I thought would happen. I thought that I would have a year where I. So one of the things I do in my private life is, and my personal life, I, I like to craft. So I crochet, I knit, you know. So I was thinking of me by three o'clock in the afternoon or two o'clock in the afternoon you know, sitting on the couch, getting the knitting out, watching movies, you know, and that's how I would be able to, not, not every single day, but that's how I would live my life. But actually I've been so busy this year and my husband keeps saying, where was the break that you were going to be taking? Because between the study, the, the, the Koala News, the work that I'm doing for clients and keeping, you know, the, as you know, in, when you run your own business, keeping in touch with people. So the networking that you've got to keep doing, there hasn't been a lot of time to have that two o'clock nap. Maybe maybe it'll come later in the year or something. Maybe. I've, I think it's also because like you've got so much that spikes your curiosity, it's, right? Yeah. And you're like, oh, no, I need to do that. Like I really do want to spend the time doing that because I'm curious and because I can. So it's not necessarily because it's something that's bringing in money, but no, once, that, your, once your curiosity spiked. Yeah. I think so. My husband described me as being proactive, 
And I, I thought that that was a, a good description that exactly that, that where something I'll, I've signed, I sign up to webinars or I go to events or, you know, activities to keep myself interested in what I'm doing in the, in the sector. And I also go to other things that are just for personal interest, but I do keep very active in, in doing things that I, yeah, I don't have time to be sitting on the couch or having that two o'clock nap. <laughs> well, actually it's funny because you know, when, when I first started my first business, Aim Overseas, back in 2007, I, I realized that I was somebody that had this really cyclical, I'm very cyclical with this, my sleep patterns. And in the afternoons, when I was working in a university, you know, three o'clock, I'd just be tanking and falling asleep at my desk. And so I just said, well, I don't have to just suffer that. I can actually go and have a lie down. And then I formed a habit around that. And now it's just a thing. So even once we had you know, 15 staff, working for, for AIM overseas in an office, we actually had a little cupboard that had a sign on the door that said nap room. And you right. could, yeah, yeah, so you had one of those little sliding things, you know, where it says like occupied or not occupied. Yep. And it, it said, it says not occupied. And then you slid it across and it had, I had a whole lot of zen. <laughs> I'm just having a nap in there. So it just became something, something that I did. So built, built some habit around it. And yeah, once again, like ultimate control, but also ultimate responsibility yeah, and right. to make sure you keep things ticking over. Yes. Yeah, which is which is a lot of fun. You mentioned AIM Overseas in 2007. So I was thinking that that was about when we met, but it mustn't have been because we met before that. So I was thinking we'd known each other for about 15 years, but it must be closer to 17. We, we would have first met, so you would have been AEI, yeah. Australian Education International. So a, a lot of people might not know what AEI is is, was, but was really the premier agency for managing international education in Australia. That's right. So AEI was set in the Department of Education, Employment and Workplace Relations as it was when I was there. You know, that the, It's now the Department of Education that goes through different changes. And at the time, it did everything. So it ran the uh, NUSA, the National Office of Overseas Skills Recognition, ESOS legislation, marketing, so study in Australia, all of the offshore representation that you have, the education counsellors, which some people will have met in different countries overseas. It, it did all of that. And I landed in AI in the Latin America section, actually. And I, I worked with the, in the Latin America desk when I first joined, because at that time, this is the first and only time that there's been a ministerial statement on education. It was Brendan Nelson. Brendan Nelson, 2005. Time. Yeah. And so he actually put some money behind it. And we got education counsellors in Latin America, in, in based in Santiago, Chile, in, and in Mexico. And you, so there was real money behind the activity that we were doing. And we, we did some fantastic work with those countries. And even you see the results today because it takes time. So some people get a bit impatient with government about, you know, they want things to happen straight away. But actually, lead to, when you're doing government-to-government -government work, it takes time to build the relationships. But we, we've seen some fantastic outcomes come from that statement and it you know shows you've, you've got to put real money behind it. Throwing in my two cents there, I mean, that was a really transformational moment. I mean, OS Help basically sprung up at that time. So That's right. on the outbound side of learning abroad, where we're sending students out, the OS Help scheme helps students to study overseas by allowing them to borrow against their hex debt. That was from the same period, the AEI initiatives. And in fact, where you and I, would have probably met would have been the national forum that I set up around outbound mobility back in That's 2005. Right. Di Yerbury chaired it, yeah. Yeah, so one of the, after I'd been in the kind of bilateral space for a while, I moved into running the scholarship program, the Endeavour Awards. Endeavor. Uh, and one of the roles that I think I feel most proud of in my whole career because we actually ran merit-based scholarships for students to come into Australia, but also the outbound mobility. So back then it was, we had not just the Endeavour Awards, we, we were running different, there was different buckets of money, including UMAP back then. So we had buckets of money to send Australians offshore. And it's something that I didn't know that I was passionate about until I started working in the area and then realised that what a fantastic opportunity. Because when I was at university, I, I was at uni late 80s, early 90s, right about when the recession was happening. And the idea of taking time to go and study overseas. And, I, and 
I, I know some people might think Canberra, you know, that there's a, a myth about Canberra that the streets are paved with gold. But I grew up in a very working class family, first in family to go to university. Dad was a washing machine mechanic, mum was a waitress. So that idea of going overseas and studying was not even a thought in my mind that that was a possibility that it even existed. And so when I realised that by the time I got into the scholarships area that there was money to send students offshore, I became very passionate to get Australians overseas because I could see. So one of the things that I'm so passionate about with international education is, and, you know, to the, the coining, to coin your podcast, The Global Horizons, how important it is to open up dialogue, to get an understanding of cultures, to appreciate where each other is coming from so and, and to build those linkages. And that's something I'm so passionate about. But if it's just one way, if it's just international students coming in, then we're putting a lot of responsibility on them when they go home to be the ones to maintain those relationships. And so getting Australians to go offshore and helping them, because like I said, I, there was no, I didn't have family money behind me to be able to pay to do that. So actually to give, have money available and now to see it in the NCP, I just think it's a fantastic initiative. I'm so sad that the Endeavour Awards was defunded because I think that it was doing such great work and at least the NCP has stayed on and I hope continues to stay on. Um, this this idea of middle class welfare narrative gets bandied about, is it's just wrong. It's people like me when I was growing up that get to take advantage of it and open their horizons. Yeah, look, the, the NCB New Colombo, Colombo Plan, so Australian government fund that helps Australian university students to study in the Indo-Pacific. Currently about 10,000 students a year are funded yeah. to have international study experiences, which if you think, Tracy, back to the days when, when you and I were working outbound learning abroad and Endeavour was, I think, around a $5 million scheme from memory. Yeah, it would have been. That's about right. Yeah, now that now that's sort of been t- 10x the, the number of students that are getting experience in the Indo-Pacific, which is our backyard. I'm very careful about using that term because it's, it's a little bit derogatory to our, our neighbours. I, I remember seeing this clip of, yeah, you know, Albo talk, talking about, you know, how our backyard is, is the Pacific and then the Pacific leaders being like, that's so derogatory. You know, like, you're not the big boy and we're, we're the, you know, we're the little neighbour. Like, we're all in this together. Yeah. So I just totally caught myself and went, oh, no, that's not <laughs> Oh, geez, you have to be so careful. But yeah, okay, NCP, fantastic initiative. You're clearly somebody very curious. You've, and you've also said that you're somebody proactive. Where did those traits come from? I mean, you said, you know, your 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 family, you know, very working class in Canberra. You know, to some extent, it's, it's a bit of a non sequitur for you to be where you are now, right? But obviously stuff has happened in your life that's made you curious, proactive, and sort of led you on this journey. So what were those things? Where'd they come from? I think I was a massive reader when I was growing up. I, you, yeah, I was. I don't know if, even if young people use this term anymore, but I was a square. And what that meant back then was, you know, somebody who uh, it, it, it seemed like he didn't. The, the derogatory side of it was that he didn't know how to have fun, which wasn't at all true. It was just the way that we had fun was I, I did a lot of reading, and so I was reading books from all different countries and different authors and it gave me insight into what was going on out in the rest of the world and I think that that's where the curiosity came from was just I was a voracious reader I would rather read than go out and play sport I was never the sporty kid I would during the school holidays you know mum was always trying to keep up with my reading what you know going to the library every second day what what's the next lot of books that I can read and I, I think that that's where it comes from and I think since then, because I've maintained that, I'm, uh, I love to read and I love to read authors from different countries and different fiction writers. And in fact, I'm reading one at the moment set in Palestine. It, it, just to have that, I think that that's where the curiosity is. I, I, I am curious about how the rest of the world operates. And probably because I've had the opportunity to go to those countries and to be inspired and to see how other people live and I, I've, I think I've been to 30 odd different countries, some of them multiple times in my career and on holidays as well. 
And I think that that's where, yeah, where that curiosity comes from. What about the productivity? You're a doer. Well, it's probably the working class mentality uh, mm. that, you know, working class who worked their way into middle class. So I won't, yeah. you know, I don't want to um, give a picture that we then didn't, get into the middle classes because Canberra was up and coming in the 70s and and 80s and mum and dad worked very hard. But dad was a sole business person, owner of fixing washing machines. If he didn't work, then there was no money coming in. So there was no fam. There was very few family holidays. And if there there were, they were down the south coast of New South Wales, which is, you know, Canberra's backyard. So that that was it for us. So I think we went to New Zealand once when I was 10 for about a week. And other than that, we, we didn't go on holidays. And I think that that's probably where the proactivity comes from is that that very much don't be a slacker, work hard. I saw my parents work really hard. Mum had two jobs, dad had two jobs. And so I think that how I was brought up and in the neighbourhood, you know, we, I was brought up in this neighbourhood of families that they, you know, everybody worked really hard. It was that starting, we moved into the house in this neighbourhood where everybody moved in for the first time. So they were all young families. I grew up with the, the the kids in the street and everybody just worked really hard and there weren't, people weren't going off on exotic holidays or driving, you know, flash cars or anything like that. It's just people worked hard and I think that that's where that work ethic comes from and I think then proactive probably comes from having that strong work ethic. It's funny, isn't it? I, I feel like that's almost the biggest gift you can get as a young person is like a good work attitude because you can run into all sorts of strife in life whether it's you know a bad relationship a bad job whatever it is you know bad luck like just run into bad luck and suddenly you know you you lose your house or whatever it is but I just feel like if you've had the good fortune to develop a good work ethic you're pretty much always going to be okay because you will find a solution. You're just going to go and work your way through it, right? You're going to find find a way out. Well, it could because one of the other jobs that I had when I was at university, I was a shelver in the – so, again, you know, I'm really dating myself. There weren't banks of computers back then. There were books in the library. And students went to the uni library and they took out a – they'd pull a book off a shelf and then they'd leave it on the desk in the library. And we would come through. We started work at 5.30 in the morning, this group of shelvers, we were called shelvers, and we would work for three hours putting the sh- books back on the shelves, filing them in, you know, the, the order with according to whatever the system was that was used. And we f- we filed book, put the books away in the library. And that was 5.30 in the morning. And I can tell you 5.30 in the morning in the middle of winter in Canberra, it, that, that <laughs> you, you've got to have a pretty good work ethic as a uni student to be getting up to be at work by 5.30 in the morning. But That's awesome too. It? Yeah. Great, great attention to detail too, right? Because you know, if you if you stuff that up, that book is literally just disappears from <laughs> disappears from from the universe pretty much once it's out, outside. Uh, the yeah, I did. there's probably a couple of books there that maybe still have never found the light of day. Because I, I do know that there was some of my colleagues that I was working with might have come in a few times uh, with a, a little bit of a hangover. <laughs> <laughs> in, into into the black hole that we were talking about, right, right, right back at the top. That's right. Very, very, very good. Actually, it just struck me, like, as you're talking about sort of work attitude and everything, you know, maybe that's also part of the reason why you you seem quite zen right now around whatever's going to come next. Because you're like, well, whatever comes, I mean, obviously you've got a great reputation, heaps of experience, but you're also like, well, I know I can, I'm going to be able to make it work, whatever ha- happens, because I'm going to make things happen if I need to. And it, the worst case scenario, I'll get myself a job. Yeah. That there'll be something you know, I won't, I, I won't not work. I, the, the, I don't have this idea that I'm too good to take on a job somewhere, whatever that job might be. If, if things got really dire, if those sliding doors, you know, you make the wrong decision, I needed to, then I'll just go get myself a job. Yeah. And I think yeah. that, that maybe that's why I'm zen about it. But that's when I was saying about everybody's at a different place in their life and have different circumstances, that wouldn't have been me for even five years ago. Uh, I, I don't think that would have been my attitude. But post COVID, and I, I've, I've had this conversation with a few people actually. So I'm very much Gen X. I'm your stereotype. If you Google Gen X, look it up. It's, it's work ethic. It's we don't like not having a job. I'm absolutely a stereotype. And as we're 
growing up and we're in our teens and early 20s and, and even into your 30s, you're told you've got to keep aspiring and you've got to keep going for the next job and the next job and the next job. And even though careers are not linear and they're not on the upwards trajectory all the time, you've got to keep aspiring to the next thing. But there's a lot of Gen Xs that are now getting to my age and a bit older that are got to the point of going, yeah, but actually I don't want the next big job. I'm looking at my boss and thinking, I, I actually want to have a life. I don't want to be working till four o'clock in the morning or working every weekend. And there was no conversation about, well, what happens when you just stop if you don't want to, and even if you don't want to just keep staying on the same level, you actually want to take a step back from your career. I think there was a, a societal shame around that, that if you did take a step back, there was something wrong with you. What's wrong with you that you're not working and you're not wanting to work full time? And why don't you want the next job? Why don't you want the to, to get that next promotion? But we're seeing, we saw it during COVID and I think we're seeing it. And I think it's, it is partly COVID, but I also think it's some Gen Xs that are realizing that there's more to life and they've worked really bloody hard. And what have they got to show for it? You know, they're, they've got money, but how much money do you actually need and, and where you've missed family, you know, birthdays or anniversaries or whatever, and you've missed going to the footy or whatever it is because you had to work. And you see some of the politicians that have made the decision or the big sp- – I mean, Melbourne, so sports, some of the coaches that have made the decision, they're making big money and they're walking away from it and saying, actually, I want to have a break from the workforce. And I think that that's fantastic and I think it's a – discussion that we need to encourage younger people to have as well that it isn't always about getting the next big thing and and aspiring to get the next you know lot of money that that the next zero on the end of the the paycheck actually there is more to life than just the money and working the really long hours and and missing out on stuff yeah it's it's so true isn't it when we've had to close down AIM overseas because obviously COVID came along and an international study travel business was not a very good business for, for yeah. a global pandemic. But one of the things we did pretty soon after we made that decision, maybe within a week, is we grabbed one of the whiteboards off the wall in the office, we brought it home and, and we did this exercise and we're like, okay, well, we couldn't control that. Oh, it's gone. Yeah. But but what what do we want? And we kind of did this big whiteboard brain brain dump of what our ideal life would actually look like. And that was things like making sure we had time as a family to do things, certain number of holidays per year, you know, being able to help our kids, starting a new business, blah, blah, blah. And working four days a week was one of the things that we said we really wanted, wanted to achieve. And it, it's taken like literally two years for us to find our current business idea that we're working on right now, which has really gotten us lit up. So that's basically a two-year discovery process of what we really wanted to do next. And we've worked in the mill. We had to earn money, just like you've said. You know, yeah. but, but we kind of have this vision for where we're heading now. And, and that's a very healthy thing. I think it makes you accountable for something outside of yourself, which can be motivating to make you work harder, to, to chase that. But it can also be, be that sort of handbrake that makes you go, actually, no, I need to stop now because if I go too down, deep down this hole, I'm going to be working too hard. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? But I, I don't want to work that hard anymore. And whilst I've, you know, we've just talked about the fact that I've got a work ethic, that I think there's a difference between that work ethic and working hard that to the point that you're killing yourself. Yeah. You know, and and missing out on too many things. It, it's yeah. I, I one of the things I've I tried to instill in you know in leadership when I was talking to my staff is that. We're not brain surgeons. Nobody will die if this thing doesn't happen. Because you do get a bit woods for the trees, that that when you're in the middle of it, you think that the world's going to fall apart if I don't get this thing done by 5 o'clock on, you know, or 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock or whatever. And actually, you know. Actually, no. Yeah. No. Yeah. Actually, no. I don't really care. It's okay. It, yeah. It's actually, that's, I love that. I love you said that. Like, yeah. People actually don't care. <laughs> or somebody's like a little bit annoyed because something comes a day late or two days late, but actually nobody nobody cares and nobody notices either. You know, your boss doesn't notice, your clients mostly don't notice. So stop putting that much pressure on yourself. <laughs> I think that that's the lesson that I tried to take away from being made redundant was that actually I you can work really hard 
and something can happen that is like you were saying you had to close down aim overseas exactly the same thing you can be working really hard something happens outside of your control and suddenly you're out of work and i think that that's a good wake up call that says to you that really you, you need to think about what your priorities are yeah when your whole self if your whole self worth is wrapped up in something that you don't actually control then yes. you probably you probably got a problem that needs addressing there yeah it was like i was saying uh, when we were talking about the two o'clock in the afternoon nap, I'm working really hard now, not necessarily in paid work. I'm not necessarily getting paid for all of the work that I'm doing, but I'm working really hard and I'm loving it. I feel that I've got the energy to do what I'm doing and I want to do it. And if I don't want to do something, then I just say, mm, sorry, I don't think that that's for me. Yeah, I I'm trying to ex trying to think about how to how to help people to understand if the, if they're working in an institution to help them un understand how that feels because to me it's this yeah, it's the ultimate control and ultimate responsibility but it's ultimately it's like this freedom right you've got this freedom to explore your interests the areas where you'd like to try and make a living the areas where you can go and learn the areas where you can create impact it's just this this beautiful freedom where suddenly you realise that you're actually not bound by these rules that society seems to put in place saying that we need to work this nine to five job for the next 40 years like you're yeah. genuinely you're genuinely free from that you mentioned that you you've traveled to 30 countries so if i could give you a magic plane ticket that you could fly anywhere direct from melbourne and land anywhere else in the world what uh, destination would you put on your magic plane ticket could be somewhere you've been somewhere you haven't been it's interesting you ask that question. So my dad's from Scotland. Where he came out in the in his early twenties with the whole family. So my grandparents and five there were five of them. And I've never been. I've never been to Scotland. And I had a plane. We had two plane tickets booked to go to Scotland in October 2020 to celebrate my 50th birthday, and we didn't get to go. And we have a vein. So if I had the plane ticket, then Scotland. It's a def and it is on the list. It's absolutely it's gonna be the next destination. We'll be heading to Scotland. I wanna see where dad's from, where the family is from. And where where in Scotland are they from? Where's the family from? So it's a, a little place called Gourok, which is on the Clyde River near Greenock, which is near Glasgow. Okay. So it was a shipbuilding area because it's on the River Clyde. So, yeah, so that is where I would want to take that plane ride. And and it's funny, isn't it, because a lot of people will say that, that the UK is a destination that they've been to and done a lot of travel in, but actually most of my travel has not been in Europe or in the UK. It's been in Asia, Latin America, uh, and particularly Southeast Asia, and multiple times to, to certain countries, but, yeah, never to the UK. And so out of all those places that you've, been to which was the one that surprised you the most and why i can't think of surprise oh i guess i can colombia so i had a fantastic opportunity to live in brazil for a couple of months as the acting education commissioner and during that time i was so the latin america education commissioner so i was responsible for travel sorry i was responsible for education and training relationship throughout Latin America. So during that time, I had the opportunity to go to Mexico, Colombia, and Chile, as well as Brazil. And, you know, living here in Australia, Colombia, it's about as far away almost as you can get. And the, of course, the media that we get here in Colombia is that it's a pretty dangerous place. I went to Bogota, and, and certainly there's some places that are more dangerous and you have to be careful in. But I went to Bogota and I think that there is, there was something there that the Colombian people, certainly the people that live in Bogota, are so similar to Australians. And I, it's really hard to put my finger on it, but there's this sensibility that was, that I could feel, I don't know, there was this affinity, similar senses of humour. And it, it just, it, the conversations that we were having, and they love living life. And it really that that's I think that is the place that surprised me is is Bogota in Colombia, awesome. and I hadn't thought about that for ages. So thank you for letting me remember it again. Yeah, it's it's, it's just a thing you know 
we, we just the other night we were sitting at the kitchen table looking through photos with the kids just kind of going through different trips and everything like that and it's, it, it is like there's so many things that we forget these great trips and actually it actually, actually occurred to me that I, I feel like there's this almost 10 year window in life where the pro, the past 10 years are really vivid for us you know whether you're 20 30 40 the last 10 years are, are really vivid and then after that you kind of start to forget quite yeah. a lot well, and also when you have been to lots of different so many places, places, you you do forget because what whilst not surprising, I I lived in Singapore for three years as the as in education commissioner, and travelled around Southeast Asia, and I had the opportunity to go to Myanmar more. Than, and this is pre the coup when it really looked like Myanmar was going to open up and be something different to what it's turned out to be, which is a real shame. And what a fantastic experience that was. So not not surprising in that sense of the the Bogota analogy, but just to see a country that was right on the precipice of of opportunity was and to be part of that was just fantastic. And I education commissioner role in in as in was the best job I've ever had with without a doubt and those opportunities that I got to travel around and around the ASEAN region but to see Myanmar where where it was and I just feel really sad that it that that hasn't happened and hope that it might happen in the future because there's so many opportunities there yeah I com- completely agree we we were my, my wife and I went through Myanmar in 2003 2004 so yeah. very early on yeah one of the most amazing places we visited just the people incredibly humble and friendly amazing 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 want the education you know there was a a staff member that we had took eight years to do her undergraduate bachelor degree because the universities just kept closing down because they because the military just would close them and she just kept plugging away and going back when it started again and uh, the i just feel those young people that have that have missed out on that opportunity to go to university is such a shame. We are very lucky where we live and with what we do in the industry, sure. even if it's part of the mafia. <laughs> even if it's we're mafia, part of that's the mafia. very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, Tracy, maybe that's maybe a good point for us to to, to wrap up on. I'm sure we'll do a, a, a round two at some point <laughs> in future. But it's been a great great deal of fun to to spend some time chatting with you on Global Horizons. So thanks so much for joining me. Thanks, Rob. It was terrific to catch up. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.